Yeah, the picture gets better when the light's off. Oh, we put that off. Oh, well, I think it, is that is that yeah. better? Yeah. yeah. All right. Do you want to turn your? I know you don't really need it. Yes, I will. I will. I will. I will turn that off. You don't help you. Okay. Let's see. I mean, that sounds like I might. I have to be careful not to overpower you. Okay, there's a reason that we are starting. This is the uh, we're talking about the role of aquaculture in coastal ecosystem management, and aquaculture has expanded rapidly over the last 30 years, and now is as much as 50 percent of the world's seafood supply. But every species has a job. And our goal in aquaculture is to raise species with food, but it also you can use aquaculture for ecological function, like placing oysters in the bay to build the bay and other things like that. And that is what we will be talking about today. If we look at this picture, 70% of the earth is the ocean. You can see even these uh, hurricanes uh, up there on the upper right hand quadrant. Um, and, and this is all this ocean and land are interacting. Everything in an ecosystem interacts with its surroundings. Here's a living shoreline. This actually is at my home. And when I started this ecosystem management technique of living shorelines, the shoreline was sort of raw dirt and eroding. I had a choice of putting in riprap, which is the stones on the uh, land itself that keeps the land from eroding, or using a living shoreline approach where you take that rocks and move it 30 to 40 feet out, and you put sand behind it, put rocks along there with riprap, and then put sand behind it to bring the elevation to a point where it's uh, green uh, spartina and grass and the marsh grasses can live, and you get something that looks like this instead of a bunch of rocks. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today and what you have to do to create a living shoreline. Uh, then let me go to my title here. So here it is the title for you. And I used to work with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And I was the program director for aquaculture for the National Sea Grant College Program, which uh, provides money to universities in the Great Lakes and all the coastal states. And I was fortunate to be able to see all the cutting edge science as it has evolved over the past 30 years. So what I'm talking to you about today is sort of my observations of how this might all fit together uh, with the technologies that we have developed. I will start with talking to you a little bit about the NOAA program. If you look here, there's a tab, there's some, a handout, and this is called ecosystem-based management, and it shows you the different ecosystems that have been recognized by NOAA. I think there are seven big ecosystems, i.e. the Gulf of Mexico is one large ecosystem. The Northeast is another, Alaska is another. So they are starting to look at, uh, the science uh, organizations are starting to look at these larger ecosystems. It used to be that management, let's look at uh, striped bass in the bay. Striped bass are going down, so you look at striped bass and you say, okay, we're gonna put a moratorium on it. Well, that's nice, it reduces some of the mortality. But the fact is that the support ecosystem that allows the growth of those striped bass is failing. As for instance, oysters used to be in the bay, and people don't think about this very often, but the oysters, when they spawn in the spring, their larvae are essential to the larvae of the striped bass. It's all connected. The timing of striped bass uh, spawning and the Food available in the ecosystem is critical to their success. So we can't just say, okay, we're going to put a moratorium on striped bass, and we have to look at everything in, as a whole. So then there's another handout here, 
And this is on integrated ecosystem assessments. And NOAA is looking at this in terms of what are all those factors we have to consider in the ecosystem and meld it into a, a, a picture that they can understand and try to manage the overall ecosystem. So what are the assessments that have to be made as part of that? Uh, also, if we take a look at what composes uh, NOAA's programs, there is the NOAA consists of the National Marine Fisheries Service, the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, and that's where I worked, the National Ocean Service, which is the more of the ecosystem and environmental area, and the National Environmental Satellites. So they're looking at all these things from the satellites and doing a lot of monitoring that way. Looking just at the aquaculture side of NOAA, just this year, in fact, about two weeks ago, they, uh, NOAA has come out with a plan to bring aquaculture into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we were, when I retired in 2006, we were almost ready to do something in the Gulf of Mexico. But the bureaucracy and the fight with all the factions, it took 10 years to get to this point here. And so when I retired in 2006, it's now 2016. And finally, they announced that they hoped to increase aquaculture in the United States by 50%. Uh, and that is going to be looking primarily at the Gulf of Mexico, where they actually have a, uh, a permit regime that somebody can actually apply to and hopefully, if they do the right job, I get a, uh, a permit. Aquaculture now provides as much as 50% of the world seafood. In the U.S., we only produce about 1% of our products, or 2% uh, of the seafood. Uh, the, we import 90% of all our seafood in the U.S., and that's one reason NOAA is looking at that Gulf of Mexico and larger scale offshore aquaculture to uh, grow the species that the wild fisheries uh, are also producing. So there'll be wild fisheries, but this allows Acme in, in the Gulf of Mexico different uh, quotas for the wild fisheries so that we can bring back some of the wild populations at the same time producing the same species for the market and export or use of the United States. So that's what I'm talking about. How do we use aquaculture in ecosystem-based management? You can put aquaculture in the production of seafood into that equation in the, in the ecosystem, and so it allows you to manage your well, your well issues in a different manner. <clears throat> so uh, if we take a look at the uh, different examples that we have seen in the past, uh, we know that in the uh, Chesapeake Bay, the managers are looking at oysters uh, in the bay as a filter mechanism to, to clarify the water. And but there's also the if they have oysters in the bay, the, as I've said before, the larvae are available for feeds for other things. <clears throat> if we look at Lake Erie, it used to be very dirty; you couldn't see more than six inches there. The visibility is now up to 20 to 30 feet. And that came because of a zebra mussel uh, exotic that came into the uh, Lake Erie and filtered and cleared the whole of Lake Erie. So the scales of living organisms, and the, the scale of their effort and their capability of uh, filtering is sufficient to work on very large bodies of water if there's enough of them. We know what and how much oyster, how much an oyster can harvest uh, or uh, filter in a day. And if, if it's a mature oyster, you can go from 40 to 50 gallons of water a day per oyster. Knowing this, we can calculate how much water's in the bay and how many oysters we'd have to have to get more clarity. And so there's a lot of work going on with models that would look at where uh, the oysters would be and what the clarity might be uh, by the filtering capacity. Up in uh, New Jersey, uh, you know, I think it was uh, 
the plant aquaculture, the up in the Providence River uh, clams uh, also were very important for clearing and filtering the water in that river and increasing the visibility. And then on the eastern shore, we've been doing clam aquaculture, and we're finding that the because that is on a scale sufficient to clarify the water, that the water is getting clearer. And that the act, it's interesting that that phytoplankton was the reason it wasn't very clear. There's a lot of nutrients from all the chicken farms going into that ecosystem. And when we put those clams in there, we've got a clarity of that. But the cages that the clams were on had a lot of benthic algae. This encouraged aquatic vegetation on them because the clams were filtering and they would put out some nutrient. And they, because the water was clearer, the phytoplankton was gone, they bent the algae uh, expanded. Well, that was interesting because they then some people objected to the clam farmers being there because they might be damaging the submerged aquatic vegetation that was growing on the clams. And people try to stop them from doing the plants, which it, 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 just, it astounds me as to the, the give and take between the social uh, uh, issues related to the agriculture issue. And then we also know that uh, from the science that NOAA has done through all the university work and, and the state programs that uh, created wetlands and submerged aquatic vegetation have documented ecological functions in terms of stripping nutrients as it's coming through those marshes and a variety of other things. Um, if we take a look at uh, some of the work in Europe, uh, individual bivalves, and this is the same sort of thing, they came up with one to four liters of uh, uh, water filtered per bivalve in uh, Europe as well. And also, here's that uh, Providence River uh, thing that I was remembering and got ahead of myself uh, where they uh, those plants filter 21 percent of the tidal volume of the Providence River as it was passing over the clam beds and that was documented through scientific study and then if we take a look at how do we model and understand the nitrogen flows in the system and the last uh, thing on that particular side deals with uh, the fact that there's nine milligrams of NH3 is uh, ammonium uh, nitrogen uh, is excreted from clams in the day. Uh, and, but for every kilogram of shellfish that we harvest, we take 16 grams of nitrogen are removed from the system. So knowing these types of relationships and how much uh, nitrogen is in a clam or in an oyster, we can determine how much nitrogen we can take out. So that allows us, again, ecosystem management and understanding and modeling the nitrogen flow uh, through a system. So now I want to, that's, that sort of gives some of the, the background. Uh, to help you understand this, and I've just talked about it, we have two types of aquaculture, really. One is extractive aquaculture, where we grow oysters or uh, mussels or clams and they help to do the removal of the nitrogen in that way. And marine algae, for instance, those, that algae that was growing on those clams in the uh, Chesapeake Bay, the uh, opportunity there, if we take that uh, uh, algae off of those plants, we're removing nitrogen uh, as we do that as well. And then there's, so there's extractive aquaculture where we grow species that actually filter or remove the nitrogen flows and improve the overall balance in the ecosystem. Bed aquaculture is something like shrimp aquaculture or fish aquaculture where the aquaculture person or the company feeds these fish or feeds the shrimp and nitrogen is going into the system and this is where some problems have occurred throughout Asia where they are feeding a lot of the shrimp into in shrimp ponds and then that nitrogen is escaping into them. So we have but the, the good part of um, this is that once we understand this, we can model it and determine carrying capacity and what is allowable for that amount of things. For instance, if we take a look at that shrimp uh, example that I talked about in Asia, where you, these are usually done on the backside of mangrove areas, and or and when they first began, they actually removed some mangroves, 
and made shrimp products. You can't do that in most countries anymore because the mangrove acts as a filter as well. So now what they're doing is they're putting the shrimp farms behind the mangroves and running any of the water that comes out through the mangroves and the mangroves capture that nitrogen. And again, that's using aquaculture and the understanding of the functions of these different species to come up with a system that works and preserves the environment. You can, this is uh, in New Hampshire, the Sea Grant program that I was in. We funded something at the University of New Hampshire, which has long line cultures of uh, mussels, the blue mussels, something like you get from the Prince Edward Island in all of our restaurants. And we have shown that we can, in this uh, as an example of the, uh, the long line methods, and we were able to grow these uh, mussels to market size in only eight months. And at the same time, if we remove those mussels from that location, this is also 10 miles offshore in the open Atlantic. It's not inshore. But we're still removing them. When we take that out, we're removing the nitrogen uh, that is in those tissues. So the, the role of marine plants in a balanced ecosystem then uh, is something that we have to look at. And for instance, uh, the in China, the, there's 4.8 million tons of marine algae grown annually for human consumption. 4.8 million tons of marine algae for human consumption. This comes to, in calculation, knowing how much nitrogen is in those algae, so is about 60 to 100,000 tons of nitrogen is removed when this is brought back on land to feed the population there. Uh, one of our uh, Top scientist, and this is a show in 2002, he's in Canada, and he makes a very easy observation that products of seaweeds, uh, production of seaweeds and animals complement one another, and how we manage that complementary um, uh, activity or relationship is what our job is as agriculturists and as coastal managers. Um, the, the, when you go into the restaurants and have a seaweed-wrapped uh, roll of any sort. That's a nori. That's a red algae primarily grown in Asia, although we have some nori farms uh, up in Maine. And we have uh, some of the research there has shown when nutrient levels get higher, the algae respond to it and become more efficient at capturing that nutrient level. So these, all of these observations have to be thought about as you look at the management. Uh, in the Philippines, algae is also very important. Uh, and this is on a oyster, uh, a UQ one is a marine algae that's quite common there, but it has a high uh, gel content and is used in paints, ice cream uh, variety. It's a good export item. And here the local villagers have jobs uh, growing this and then uh, exporting this to markets for uh, many different manufacturing processes. Uh, here's a, like we talked a little bit about the China situation where there was 100,000 tons of uh, marine algae. This is a type of algae that they're growing. Uh, this actually uh, was grown in New Hampshire. We did the same sort of growth. Uh, these are lines that were put out uh, there, and you can see the, the algae. Um, uh, and this is a kelp, and we have very good production. It shows you how uh, efficient the kelps can be in terms of growth and capturing of nutrients. This is a picture that I think was a turning point in my understanding of the relationships of aquaculture and the environment and polyculture. Uh, what you're looking at here, those are lobsters on the outside of a aquaculture cage in, the, in Puerto Rico. You see the red color is the algae that is growing there because we are feeding the fish within a cage. We are growing a fish called cobia. The nutrients are coming out. The algae started to grow. The red algae, which is a very high protein algae, that nori that we wrap things in is a red algae, uh, something like this. And the lobsters, that was their, uh, and the science has shown that certain red algae will cause lobster larvae to land on a location because it has the right food for the lobsters. Baby lobsters landed on there, started to grow, and reached market size in eight months. 
of the marine algae that was there. I look at this and I, I, and I, I said, ah, I see these connections, and that's why I'm talking to you today, is for understanding this, it was a pivotal point, in, in understanding every species has a job, and if we do things right, we can make it work together. What kind of fish was that for you, Brian? Uh, cobia. Okay. Uh, that also comes into the bay, down there, the part of the bay. Cobia is an interesting fish. It has the fastest growth rate I have ever seen. From A, in one year, 16 pounds. Of, uh, you can get a 16 pound cobia, and we did not know that. It was uh, interesting, we were doing the hatchery work at the University of Miami, and we were gonna ship the cobia to Puerto Rico, and we had maybe cobia like this, and we were making the arrangements, and it took two weeks more before the airplanes all came together, well, they were this big, and then it became this big for the shipment. And we had to use twice as many bags and twice as many boxes uh, because we couldn't keep up with the growth rate of the COVID. That's been always a, a fun problem, right? So now I'm getting out of the aquaculture and the background and, and how ecosystems, in a broader sense, can uh, should, we should be looking at them. And we've talked a about how the NOAA has shifted to looking at ecosystem-based management. So this is my home in uh, Southern Kelver County, and I'm a, I'm a master gardener uh, also. I, I love working, and I'm talking to practically all master gardeners here today, I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you look at this, I also am doing ecological management at my home. Uh, the, the, the beds you see here capture the water as it flows, and the plants uh, remove that water and the nutrients that are there. And I have a lot of raised beds like that all around in order to capture nitrogen on my property. Then I go to the backyard and I have water. And of course, I'm thinking oysters when I came down here and, and the ecological functions that they do. So I have oysters under, under the dock for the ecological purposes. I found out that uh, we have a minnow that loves to get in with the oysters, so I always have a good supply of fishing minnows. Uh, this is, that's part of the uh, fun of growing oysters under your dock. And I found that a cascade of life happens among those oysters, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. The question is, how then do we manage all of this in the, in the larger picture, understanding the functions and the, uh, the biological cascade that occurs when you put oysters or then these keystone species uh, into the environment. So uh, this is a picture of a living shoreline that I created when I, uh, in order to control erosion. And I talked a little bit about that at the very beginning, and this is what it looks like now. We're gonna look at how this came together over time. Uh, this, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what the state of Maryland uh, says about these living shorelines. They are trying to encourage them because they are far superior than uh, to putting riprap on, on the shore. You create a lot more ecological habitat and the marsh grasses that you put into there strip the nutrients and also capture sediment making for clearer water. So they do have a program to increase these areas and permits are required for both the county and the state and there are fees for processing. However, if you put riprap on your shore, it is, uh, you have to go through the Corps of Engineers, and that particular project can be very expensive and take years to get a permit. Whereas living shorelines, uh, because of their ecological value of the state's recognition of that, is a much quicker and, uh, and more positive response uh, for it. So if you want a faster resolution and a, one that's ecologically better, I, the living shoreline makes sense to me. Uh, okay. So here's how we build one. This is at, at my, my project area. Uh, we put these stones around where we wanted to add the marsh. And then we bring in sand so that, because as we're moving offshore, of course, the depth of water is getting uh, deeper. And the types of marsh grasses that we have uh, require a narrow band of where the water is. If it's too deep, they don't grow. And if it's uh, too shallow or too high, 
we had a couple of species coming in, another one of the marsh grasses, uh, but for uh, the Spartina ultraflora, the more common one, you want it as a narrow range. So you have to put the sand at a point where that grass is going to be happy and you don't want it to be too deep. So uh, that's part of what is placed behind those, rock, those rocks. Then the sand is distributed by hand. It's not that hard. Uh, and made, and we look at the elevations to make sure that we're doing everything right. And here it is, uh, complete. Actually, this is my neighbor did this, did this at the same time I did. We went together. Uh, we're looking back at my, uh, you can see the, the barge in the background. That's out, going on to my property, and we're on my neighbor's uh, yard looking there. And uh, there's the osprey nest that was part of the deal. Uh, I put that out. We have, uh, incidentally, two very nice, almost fungible uh, osprey this year. And that's part of the, the, the thing that goes along with it. And here, if we take a look, you can see the marsh grasses planted that we just uh, we were able to transplant and bring those in and put them in, and that was at about uh, three months. And here's what it looks like today. Now, you're supposed to have, uh, after the state requires that, at 80, uh, that after you're done here, 85% of the project area has to have marsh grasses in it. Well, I'm having trouble with that because the ducks come every year and uh, dabble and dig out the roots uh, on the leading edge and so it's hard to get the stay ahead of the ducks but then again isn't that what a living shoreline is all about you want a place that the ducks find attractive i also have a new resident muskrat and so we're seeing a, a, and not only that but all the minnows that were associated somewhat with our oysters under the dock are coming into that marsh and there's schools of them feeding on high tide. They flood in and they pick up all their food and the, uh, the uh, forage base uh, is increased with those minnows. And then I'm seeing more white perch coming around to have the minnows. And so all of this, as I said, is a cascade of life and, and ecosystem diversity and richness that increases the life in that creek. So, I'm going to again say we're, we started at my front yard, and now we're in the backyard, and what can, and all of this is gardening, and just a, just a different one is more wet than the other, uh, but it all needs to be integrated into a functional ecosystem. And the little rhino, the little periwinkles here, I'm finding all through that marsh. And I can tell you that they're very, those are very good for fish bait. If you mash them and put it on the white perch, are very, they like the, the snails. Uh, I, I try not to take too many of them because they have a job to do there, which is keeping the marsh grass clean. They eat the epiphytic uh, algae on these uh, marsh grasses, keeping them uh, a little cleaner and more healthy themselves. So, what are the considerations uh, for a living shoreline? Uh, there is a $750 permit fee. Uh, however, I thought that that was, it's not any worse than what you do with the Corps of Engineers and all the other types of things that you would have to do. Uh, you need a permit from the county and the state. You have to think about how many, uh, how, in terms of cost, how many stones you need per uh, script per linear foot. And you have to think about a source of marsh plants and uh, you can go online and find that. The state will also help you do that. It took uh, us uh, about three months to get all of the permit done, uh, and it was really quite easy, and they wanted to help us with that. Uh, the marsh plants uh, need to be installed and maintained. That's that 85% coverage I talked to you about. And we need a site plan ahead of time. And this does not have to be too detailed. This is what I did by hand, and they accepted. I talked about, I gave them, uh, oh, it has to be, you see that MH, well, that's mean high water. So you have to know where the mean high water is. And uh, being a marine biologist, I had a pretty good idea of where that was. Uh, and you can come 35 feet out from mean high water for where your stones would be. And so I calculated that. And then I, you have to have an opening. Uh, you see that the, stone, the, the stones come around the front, there's a setback. And the water and the and the you have to have a passage for any wildlife to come in and out. 
So you, by doing that setback, I have two two channels where they can come in, and they accepted my uh, rather crude drawing and said thank you very much. So you don't have to have a blueprint and a, and a, and a big uh, company to do it. So the benefits of living shorelines I've gone over with you already, and it's, it's on your you have the slide there. So now, seeing as I was involved in the history of the oysters in the Chesapeake Bay from about 1985 to my return in 2006, I want to give a little bit of a feel for what the state is doing on the oysters in terms of aquaculture, in terms of wild management, because the oyster is a key species that you and that we can use in ecosystem-based management, uh, as I've tried to demonstrate to you here. The oyster harvest uh, back in the 1800s was up around 15 million bushels, and then fell shot into two or three million uh, bushels in the mid-1900s, and we were below 100,000 bushels uh, by the time we were in the mid-90s. Uh, the, the amount or the abundance of oysters is moving up, up slowly because of many restoration projects by the state. But the greatest increase has been occurring with aquaculture of oysters. And we are seeing, if you start to see more foreign oysters, if you go to Chesapeake County, here in the county, their oysters are available. Some are foreign and some are wild. So we're, and, uh, but some of the, uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what Virginia is doing on this compared to Maryland. But uh, we are seeing, we're way down below almost 1%. Uh, everybody has heard all those statistics that how long did it take for oysters back in the 1800s to filter in the bay? And it was something like three or four days they could filter all the volume of the bay. And now, they're, if you take a look at it, it would take several years to, uh, in terms of how many oysters you have versus the job to be done in the Chesapeake. So, in the Maryland programs right now, uh, there are several key points that they're working on. They want to focus on restoration strategy. That means what, how they can put uh, bed, natural uh, shell banks out for uh, actually for the wild fishery to take or to have a sanctuary. So they, the state is working to build certain ones where fishing is not occurring and others that provide uh, assistance to the uh, water. They, but so they want to expand the sanctuary program. The sanctuary is that area that you will not uh, harvest, and also that will provide the juvenile oysters or the larval oysters for the rest of that particular river system. Um, so, the, and then really trying to work to scientifically manage the wild fishery. For instance, in many of the places, there's so few oysters left, but they are real survivor oysters. They've made it through all the diseases, all the coal, all the other stuff. You want to preserve that genetic material. You don't want to harvest that genetic material. So if you were in a place like that, you would set aside, in my opinion, as a coastal manager, you would uh, select a place where you want to allow the harvesting, you stop all of that, you let the wild fishermen do that, and you preserve those places where those natural stocks and those genetic stocks that are made through all the, uh, the challenges in the past to be their food stock. Uh, they also want to shift commercial production to aquaculture in the state. Now. And they are uh, fairly uh, strong in their support of aquaculture. Um, and, they, and the next point is we have to oyster bar material. Uh, we have to put uh, hard substrates down. Maybe oysters have to have something hard on. The state is working uh, hard on to, it, to attach to. And the state is working on that. Uh, the Oyster Disease Manage Against Oyster Disease work, that was the program that I was involved in. Noah spent $2 million a year for a decade, or $20 million, to come up with a disease free oyster, working with the University, several universities, Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences, University of Maryland, Rutgers University. Uh, we are all looking at how to come up with disease resistant oysters because there's two diseases that will. Uh, decimate uh, the MSX and the thermal that wiped out 80 or 90 percent of the oysters in certain areas. 
Uh, that work led to an oyster that was about 30 to 40 percent more resistant, which finally allowed, uh, and you can't start an oyster farming business if you know you're going to lose 90 percent of your stock. So we were able to come up with an oyster that was strong enough to make it to market size in the farming situation, and that's why you're seeing our uh, oyster farms being more successful. A lot of people don't know how it all developed along those lines, and it's based upon science and, and people working together to come up with something that will work uh, for the production of food and the uh, safety of the people and the oysters. Um, we've increased hatchery production is one of the other things that Merrill wants to do for the point. Over on the western shore, uh, at the University of Maryland, produces several billion oysters in uh, larvae a year and hundreds of millions of staff to go on shells that go to uh, the program called Maryland Grows Oysters, where people grow oysters under their dock. And so part of what has to happen is have hatcheries. Aquaculture, again, is the hatchery. And that is what's supplying the juvenile oysters today. So that's another point of how aquaculture and the technologies of aquaculture are used in the, in the wild fisheries. And they also are looking at enhancing law enforcement so that the uh, areas that are approved are not poached. And that has been a long-term problem. And uh, also increase citizen involvement. And again, that's why people growing oysters under their docks, and they do have a program for that, and they coordinate it at the state level. And to, they, I found this interesting, this was on their uh, web page, and they also are using inmate labor. Uh, to have uh, prisons to make uh, cages and uh, other things to grow the aquaculture for the restoration project. Jim, that's yeah. shifting commercial production to aquaculture commercial production. Is that talking about the future of the farms? Uh, no, it's growing oysters in, uh, in leases. The state has leases. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The state has leases around where we are growing aquaculture products and then selling it really into the markets. But the commercial, okay, I'm sorry, commercial. To aquaculture. Right now, commercial production was wild fisheries. Going out and just catching the oysters where they could. Now they're saying that they want to focus more on habitat. But to give you an idea, Maryland has resisted aquaculture of oysters for a long time because the water that I'm looking at this is wet. Virginia. Uh, and, and Maryland never had a real strong lease program, even in the early 1900s, but Virginia did. They had a lease program for the, uh, for the people there. Virginia is so far ahead. They have a, because of the shift they did, they have an oyster industry, aquaculture industry, worth $30 million in Virginia. Maryland, because of the resistance, has an industry worth a million or something. And again, this is just the social differences and the legal differences between the two states and their approaches. So all of this is the hard part. How do we manage ourselves? That's what it really comes down to. So part of it is this uh, that the state that the state has is the Maryland Grow Oysters program. And I don't know if you can see this. But this is a location, this shows all the locations here of where the state provides baby oysters to people who go under their docks and then move those oysters from the docks to the sanctuary systems. And those barn areas there uh, are, uh, well, there's sanctuaries spread throughout that area, and the, all the oysters going into the docks are supposed to go in those state sanctuary areas. That's their model. Their okay. So, uh, let me talk a little bit about this then. The, since the 2002 time period, uh, when the Maryland government decided to subsidize oyster gardening, uh, they put in a opportunity, a tax-free opportunity, $500 of tax credits to buy floats, cages, or other equipment for oyster gardening. So if you wanted to put oysters under your dock or in any location that you had legal access to, uh, you can uh, get a $500 uh, tax credit. Now, it's an interesting thing. They don't, though, once you pay for the oysters the first year, but if you put more oysters in after you brought that out, that's not tax deductible. 
So it's only for the, primarily for the equipment of doing the testing. Then they have a limit of up to three flows or four gauges allowable under the homeowner docks. Uh, if I were king for a day, every dock in the bay would have oysters the whole length of it. And that they and the distance between docks uh, there uh, between the private owners, you need to clarify the whole bay by having these uh, intersections of the nutrient going along the dock. But I'm not king. That'll be another day, I think. Uh, the, there is a wetland license is needed for any commercial culture operations with the Corps of Engineers. So if you want to start an oyster farm, you have to deal with the Corps of Engineers, and that can take years uh, to get there. So that's one. Maryland, uh, Virginia's been working on it more, and they're in a different, I think they're in a different uh, Corps of Engineers district. And their, their Corps of Engineers people are more receptive. And from Maryland North, that Northeast area, the, the, the Corps of Engineers is not very helpful. Got to watch on on stream here. That would be good. Okay. Uh, here's uh, oysters under my dock, and they. It's fascinating to me how much happens there. And I, I you can see I have three go here. I have my three uh, floats. If I have my way, I have twenty. Uh, but the it's, it does take a bit of work, and I'll go over some of that. This is an oyster cage. This is what the Maryland Grow Oyster program uses uh, to get to people. It's a little different than what I use. And you can simply lower this cage with its oysters. And these are spat on shelf. Uh, the corn plant produces an oyster, uh, or uh, oysters on an oyster shell. So there might be six or seven what we call spat or baby oysters on a shell. And then you take these shells and put them into here and grow them up for a year. And that, they start out in the cage is about 20% uh, full of shell with little oysters on it. By the end of the year, it is a solid block of oysters that might weigh 30 or 40 pounds to lift it up out of the field. And then we take those over to the designated areas uh, for that. When you, you take these cages out and shape them, I, this is hard to see, but you see those squiggly things? Those are eels that come out. Uh, there's crabs in there. There's uh, little minnows up on the right hand side. There's little fish that are. In call a, call a frying pan fish or a uh, stargazer, there's all the and little coke ponds, little shrimps, all of that shakes out of those uh, cages. So it creates this cascade of life. So this is what, what, I, what I use is I use an oyster bag and I have a little power washer to keep my uh, bags clean and I throw those bags into those three floats. So one on top of another, I put about three of the bags in each float, and I can have several hundred oysters under the dock all pumping and cleaning uh, the water. Uh, I find that the water snakes uh, love to sit on the floats and uh, catch the minnows. Uh, so there is that, and the ducks like to sit on the, on underneath the dock uh, on my floats. And so again, there's a little, all of this, comes together between the living shoreline, the oysters, uh, what I do on the land with my uh, uh, retaining walls and beds and all that type of stuff. All of it is working within a unit to, to control the nutrient coming, at least from my Yes? Uh, it, it doesn't, I, as long as, it, the, in the summertime, it doesn't make too much difference, but in the wintertime, it does. Uh, I like to have at least two to three feet. Uh, but if, if we get a low tide and goes three feet of water goes out and it's in the winter time and they're sitting in the open, then they can die. So I think I move them from the mid dock all the way to the end of the dock uh, in the winter so that I'm in five feet of water in the winter. So there, there's a problem there if you're too close. So I would tell you three feet to four feet is will work in most situations. But I, I'm a little cautious. I've seen it go out to four to five feet of a low tide, you know, with all of water in the winter when you get a strong north wind. Okay. Uh, so, in order to put the right number of uh, shells now, these are uh, small oysters that I uh, purchased from one of the hatcheries. Again, that's an aquaculture operation that produces these. These are uh, freestanding oysters. And I count out one pile of 200, 
and then I make the size of it, and I make other piles that look about the same size. I don't count every oyster, but I try to do it by volume and look. And then I put those in the bags, and then I put them in the, in the floats. So here's the spat on shell with a one year old. You can see there's a large shell underneath that. There's five or six oysters. Uh, down below, over to the left, one on top of that. So this is a clump of five or so oysters uh, that are growing on those shells. And that gives you an idea of the growth rate in one year. In an 18 uh, months, uh, you, it's, uh, you cannot eat any oysters growing on your dock. But in, and so here's what an 18 month oyster looks like growing there, and that would be a market size oyster. Uh, so it gives you some idea of how healthy uh, that environment is. Usually, if you lift oysters up into the water column, uh, closer to the surface, the types of algae that are near the surface uh, seem to be more, I'll, I'll say, nutritious, but certainly beneficial or more abundant. I'm not sure what, what the difference is. But if you're on the bottom in the sediments, the oysters don't grow. It takes two in the on, on bottom oyster culture. Uh, to get this size oysters takes three years to four years. Uh, whereas if you're up floating, it's about 18 months. So the take-home message here is aquaculture can be used for ecological function in aquatic ecosystems. And we need to use ecosystem-based management. Uh, and, and utilize the natural, biological, ecological functions as a means to create balanced ecosystems. Uh, that is part of what I kind of, uh, in terms of that was on those handouts earlier. And then I'm going to close up with uh, some, a project I'm working on that I think is interesting too. It's on a different scale. Uh, I work with the, well, my first job was as fisheries biologist of the Trust Territory of the Pacific for seven years, and I lived on the island of Palau. And Palau has just recently, they're taking the lead in how to do ecosystem-based management in a tropical environment. Because I lived on Palau for seven years, I've gone back there and worked with the government uh, as a private uh, person, uh, working with the Palau Aquaculture Cooperative, which is made up of about 50 giant clam farmers. Uh, the, when I was there, we built a marine lab and we started working on giant clams back in the 1970s, and we were able to produce uh, all seven species of giant clams. That led to small clam farmers all around Palau being able to grow the clams for both food and the ornamental trade. So in my retirement, I went back to where I started and I'm going to help those giant clam farmers uh, with uh, their product and have a small hatchery that gives them more security. But I'm also looking at the fact that the Palau has just recently decided with the, the government, the Minister of Marine Resources and the President of Palau, that they want to stop all capture of, of commercial fishing in the lagoon and exporting of their item species, which is exactly like that example I gave for the Gulf of Mexico, where agriculture can pick up the slack for it to change the your management regime. So what's happened now is that there's no more fish being exported from the reefs of Palau. And I am not interested in putting the cages like you see here in the more open ocean, away from the coral reefs, in 100 feet of water and submerged 25 feet below the surface to grow the fish that used to be exported from the lagoon. And we got a grant from the South Pacific Commission uh, to do that, and we are working on it. I have, uh, because I started my career in Palau and I have a network of Palau and friends, uh, we're all working together. There's only 20,000 people in Palau, so everybody's a relative of everybody. <laughs> and so I have a know the president because I knew his father uh, 40 years ago. And so we all get together and we try to decide how to use aquaculture in an ecosystem context. They have created coral reef uh, sanctuaries all around the lab now, and they've made it the first shark uh, sanctuary uh, in the Pacific Islands. Uh, so all of this is just right for trying the concepts of how we use aquaculture uh, in ecosystem management. So uh, last month, I went and we built two of these cages uh, to grow groupers and uh, coral reef fishes like a rat fish or a herbivore. And the urban world will also be in the cages to keep the cages clean. They have a job to do. And so I'll have, and then the groupers have the highest market value 
and uh, we're looking at selling that to the Asian markets, and then keeping the fish on the reefs for the tourism. They have 80,000 tourists a year that come to Palau and look at the beautiful coral reefs, but everybody kept catching all the fish off of the reefs. So now they're enforcing the, the, with the conservation officers that people are not to catch those fish off the reefs. They are putting the sanctuaries aside to allow natural reproduction to occur, and they have supported this concept of using aquaculture for the export of the species that they used to export. So I was very excited about that. Uh, and then here's what it looks like in the water. That those yellow, that yellow structure there is an air bladder. We simply let the air out and it sinks down to 25 or 30 foot below the surface. So you can't see it, so the view state is not uh, uh, compromised in any way. And this is what it looks like. That's all you see of it. Actually, the uh, white area there you see is a, a diver uh, who's uh, removing the uh, bigger float. So the only thing you see is that yellow thing under the water that uh, it's submerged and that cage is there. And we can produce about 3,000 pounds of grouper in that cage uh, over a year. But what, am I, what are we doing in addition to offset the nutrient that's going to come from feeding those fish? We are going to grow algae adjacent to those cages and measure how much biomass that is and what the nitrogen is in that algae so that we're trying to move towards nitrogen neutral aquaculture by growing the species that absorb the, uh, the nitrogen from that. In addition, giant clams are filter feeders. And we're going to put the giant clams in the same area here. They filter and absorb nitrogen. Uh, giant clams are interesting in that they, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of them, they sometimes have blue colors in their uh, shirt or mantles. And, other colors, those are all algaes, those antelae is the name of that, in the tissues, and they require nitrogen. So if we put the clams there, where we, clams are like a plant. They have to be, uh, if, if they have more nitrogen, they grow better. So we'll have the giant clams and the algae removing the nitrogen. We will calculate the nitrogen in, in terms of the feed that we put into the cage, and the nitrogen out in terms of the biomass and the nitrogen fixation that occurs either by the fish by the algae or the giant plants. And we're going to put probably giant, uh, the uh, sea cucumbers underneath to pick up any of the tritical material so that we are there, uh, we're trying to do everything in a, a neutral approach. So this is the first time that's being tried in a uh, tropical environment. So I'm excited about that. And But it's still putting all of those things that I've talked to you about today, putting it to work. And all about every species has a job. Everything should be in balance. And we have taken everything out of balance by our actions. Now we have to put things, because we are the controlling factor on this planet now, we have to put things back into order as best we can by the processes we use. And that's, that's my message to you today. Thank you. So, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, what would you, how would these be, like, so in the store, they would call farm raised? They would. Wild, yes. If you go into the oyster, uh, any place you can buy an oyster, you'll find farm raised or wild. Uh, there's several certification processes uh, for uh, those that are grown in environmentally sustainable ways. Uh, people, for instance, shrimp farms have the uh, ability to be certified as uh, friendly, and when you buy your shrimp, uh, which 80% uh, of all shrimp are farmed today, uh, you can look for the farms that have the certification. There's at least three certifying agencies or groups that do that. And one of the things that we are trying to do by our process in the Palau example is to have everything certified organic. For instance, the feeds we feed the fish, we will only use by non uh, uh, NGO products in the feeds, and we will use uh, wherever we can, instead of uh, using forage-based uh, fish uh, for the feeds, we will use uh, waste products from uh, uh, seafood processing. Now, those are ways that you can make aquaculture better. Yes? Um, going back to your living shoreline, right. and the spartina grass needs a particular level of water, are you concerned at all about Sea level rise. Of course. 
have any plans for uh, figuring out what you could do? Or you the only thing 